Kirchhoff's second law is that the sum of voltage changes is equal to zero in a loop. So first we'll need to look at what is a loop. A loop we will define as any enclosed area of wire. For example, this area here would be called a loop. This area here is also a loop. In fact, this area here is also a loop. In order to solve any problems that they would present, we would only need to examine two loops. So we're just going to choose two loops and, and look at how we can solve problems. We'll look at this loop, which we will call Roman numeral 1, and this loop, which we will call Roman numeral 2. Just like in gravitation, where you need to define the direction of positive or negative, just like when we looked at the first Kirchhoff's law and we had to define the direction of currents being positive or negative, indeed here we need to do the same. So we need to say what direction going around a loop will be positive or negative. You choose whatever you wish, it's arbitrary, but then you stick to it. For example, we can say that moving this way around the loop, so moving in this way around the loop, would be positive. So let's be consistent. So moving this way around this loop would also be called positive. So now let's move around the loop and watch the sum of voltage changes in order to resolve Kirchhoff's second law. So here we leave epsilon 1 and we're going around the circuit in this direction and we have our first voltage change. What is our first voltage change? Well, we saw from our electricity equations, the fundamental equations include P equals IV and V is equal to IR. And so we have our first voltage change, which will be V is equal to IR. In other words, I1, R1. That's our first voltage change, I1, R1. And notice that the direction of positivity being this way, as we're going around the circuit, I1 is in the direction of positivity. So it's a positive I1, R1. Now, as we're going along the circuit on, in our loop, I1, R1, we come down here, down here and we go through the second voltage change, V equals IR, so this is I3, R3. And that's positive because I3 is in the direction of positivity. So we come around here, I3, R3, and then we enter the battery at the negative terminal. Many students find that it is easiest to remember this such. That is, that when you enter the negative terminal of the battery, then the value for your voltage is negative. When you enter the positive terminal of the battery, then the value is positive. So as you come along and you enter the negative terminal, we have negative epsilon 1, which is equal to 0. So the sum of voltage changes is equal to 0. Now let's look at our second loop. That was our first loop. Let's look at the second loop. In the second loop, again, we will go around in this direction. Now, as we go around in the direction of positivity, we find our first voltage change. But notice that I3 is going downwards, but positivity is upwards. So we have our first voltage change, which would be negative I3, R3, because the current is going in the opposite direction as to what we defined as being the positive direction. So here we go. Continuing in the positive direction, we come across in this way, and we have our second voltage change. As I2 is moving in this direction, we're moving in the opposite direction, so our second voltage change will be negative I2, R2. 
and then as we're going around the circuit we enter the positive terminal of the battery which is positive epsilon 2 and all that is equal to 0. So the sum of voltage changes is equal to 0. Using these equations you would be able to solve whatever problem they're going to provide to you. Just understanding these basic laws, Kirchhoff's laws, the first and second laws, sum of current changes, sum of voltage changes, and also the basic equations that we looked at, which are the, the equations for resistance in parallel and series, voltage, V equals IR, P equals IV, and the equation for capacitance, which is Q is equal to CV. That is the end of electricity. We are now going to move on to waves, light, and optics. We will now examine waves, light, and optics. We will begin our discussion with waves. First, a definition. Waves are an energy transfer by periodic disturbances of a material medium. The exception is electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves transfer without a material medium. For example, light. Light can transfer throughout space without having a material medium. There are two types of waves. There are transverse waves and longitudinal waves. In a transverse wave, disturbed particles vibrate perpendicular to the advance of the wave front. In a longitudinal wave, disturbed particles vibrate in the same direction of the advancing wave front. So let's look at some examples. An example of a transverse wave, let's imagine it's spring break and you're going to Cancun you're hanging out at the beach and you're thinking of what else? Physics. So you're looking at the water on the beach and you see that there are waves. And the waves, you notice, are advancing onto the beach. Let's imagine that a bug lands on the water. So you see a bug that lands on the water and is right here at the surface of the water. Well, as the waves are advancing onto the beach, what do you notice about the bug? Is the bug moving towards the beach or is the bug going up and down on the surface of the water? Good experiment to try and you will notice that the bug goes up and down on the surface of the water. It does not move towards the beach. Therefore, we have a wave that is advancing in this direction, yet the disturbed particles on the wave are moving up and down. Thus, the disturbed particles are moving in a perpendicular direction to the advancing wave front. That's the definition of a transverse wave. Another classic example of a transverse wave is if you could imagine a student taking a rope and attaching it to a wall. If the rope is attached to the wall and the person goes like this or flicks the rope, then what will happen is that you will see a wave moving towards the wall. So there's an advancing wave front towards the wall. But clearly the whole rope doesn't move towards the wall because you're still holding on to one end of the rope. Therefore, the wave front moves towards the wall, but the disturbed particles, which are the parts of the rope, actually just go up and down. Transverse wave. Now let's look at a longitudinal wave. And this is where the disturbed particles move in the same direction of the advancing wave front. And the classic example of this is sound. In fact, there was a film uh, some years ago uh, called uh, Back to the Future Part 2 and in it Michael J. Fox stands in front of a huge speaker and a speaker is just a classic shape of something that could create a longitudinal wave because the speaker is shaped sort of like a cone and 
pushes in this direction and as it pushes it disturbs particles in the air in the same direction of the wave front which advances. And so in the film Michael J. Fox stands in front of a massive speaker, puts on a guitar and then plays his guitar and goes flying backwards which is an exaggeration of the movement of particles in the same direction of the advancing wave front. There are a couple of consequences of sound being something that disturbs particles in the same direction of the advancing wave front. Here are some important consequences. First, there is no sound in a vacuum. That is to say that if you were to take a container and remove all particles from the container and you were to put an alarm clock in it, say those old-fashioned metal alarm clocks that uh, bang and ring and so on, and you were to put that into a vacuum, which means a container which is evacuated of all particles, then the alarm clock would go off and you would see it motioning that it was actually going off, you would not hear anything. And that is because there's no particles around it to transmit the wave. So there can be no sound in a vacuum. Another consequence is that solids are better transmitters of sound than, for example, uh, gases or liquids. Why? Because obviously a solid is something that is more dense and therefore it has more particles that will vibrate in the same direction of the uh, advancing wave front. Classic example is, uh, for example, a, a train. If a train is approaching, um, you will be able to hear it, obviously, uh, that the train is approaching, but before you can hear it through the air, if you put your ear to the tracks, you will actually be able to hear the sound approaching long before someone could hear the, so uh, the sound of the train just from the air. Because the transmission of the sound through the solid, the tracks, will be much more acute than it would be through the air. Obviously, I am not recommending that you try this experiment. Third thing is that the velocity of the wave increases as the temperature increases. This is sort of uh, like kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, one would expect, increases with temperature, the movement of particles. So as the kinetic energy increases, the particles are more mobile and therefore can transmit your sound wave much more capably. So as the temperature increases, so will the velocity of wave. Now let us look at a structural wave and some of its characteristics. We are now about to look at some important characteristics of waves. This is the crest of a wave and this is the valley. Over here the height of the wave is called the amplitude. The amplitude of a wave is related to intensity. Intensity represents, for a sound wave, loudness and for light, which is a form of electromagnetic radiation or wave, intensity represents brightness. So this is the amplitude. Here is a wavelength, which is the length, of course, of one wave. Now, one wavelength is also defined as the distance between two crests or the distance between two valleys. It could also be represented in this manner. The wavelength is related to the frequency of the wave, which we'll talk about in a moment. In terms of frequency, however, when there are two waves passing through the same medium with the same frequency, they form a standing wave, which is represented in this manner. A standing wave has different aspects of it. One of the aspects is there are portions of the standing wave that does not move. These areas here of a standing wave which do not move is called the nodes. 
the part of a standing wave that has maximal motion here and here, these are called the antinodes. They have maximal motion, which means they will move up and down in this manner. When two waves pass through the same medium, they can interfere with each other in many ways. The most important things are constructive and destructive interference. Thus we have constructive and destructive forms of interference. Let's imagine that there are two waves that are completely in phase. These two waves would lead to a maximal constructive interference. What is very important to notice is that each point on the wave is added to the other wave. Thus, the resulting wave has a greater amplitude. And of course, as we mentioned before, that refers to intensity, loudness, or brightness, depending on what type of wave we're talking about. So the amplitude is much, much greater. However, notice that the wavelength is unchanged. So constructive interference leads to an addition of the amplitude, but no change in the wavelength. Now let us look at destructive interference. For maximal destructive interference, we need two waves which are exactly out of phase. So these two waves are exactly out of phase. So if we were to add each point to the other wave, then we would get this, which is a flat line, nothing at all. In other words, for maximal destructive interference, you would either have no sound or no light as examples. In fact, this is one of the things that were, was used in order to develop stealth type technologies, and that is to create something that is able to listen for loud sounds and create wavelengths which are opposite in phase. And then throwing out these wavelengths would lead to two sounds which are loud but exactly out of phase, creating no sound at all. So you can imagine how this could be used for airplanes. Now here is another consequence of interference, but now for light. Diffraction. Diffraction is defined as the bending of light around corners. And there is actually an experiment which is often done in first year college courses which is able to demonstrate diffraction and patterns caused by diffraction. It's called the Young Slit Experiments. And the reason it's called a slit experiment is because a dark glass piece is taken and fine slits are made in the glass. The slits are so thin that they are of the order of the wavelength of light. So let's imagine that we have a slit here. We're super magnifying it and this is of the order of wavelength of light. Now let's imagine that light is on the other side of the board and this board is completely black and there's only this one slit where light can come and illuminate where we are. What we would see if this slit is really, really tiny is that light would be coming through as waves. So you can imagine that because of the shape of a wave, some of the light will appear to bend around the corner. 
where the experiment becomes very interesting is that many slits are placed in this glass. And therefore, as light comes out, the light is going to start to interfere. When light interferes constructively, it will create a bright band of light. Where the light will interfere destructively, there will be simply darkness. And so, in the young slit experiment, which provides evidence not just for diffraction, which is light bending around corner, but also shows evidence of interference of waves, you would see bright bands, dark bands, and also other shades of gray where there might be different levels of interference between the different waves. Now let's look at some equations that you absolutely must memorize. Now we're going to look at a few equations that you absolutely must memorize. Let's begin with a definition. First, frequency. Frequency is defined as the number of waves passing a point per second. The units is hertz. First equation. Frequency is equal to 1 over t, where t is the period of the wave because the period of the wave is simply the inverse of frequency. Clearly, the period of the wave is the number of seconds required for one wave to pass or oscillate. Second equation, beat frequency. And that's simply equal to the difference in frequencies. Now, to explain beat frequency, I would have to give some notes, and I must say that as a courtesy to my friends, I never sing in public. But I so much want you to understand this concept that I will demonstrate what beat frequency is. A beat frequency is often seen by musicians, and what they would do is they would play two notes that are very similar in order to tune their instrument. Classically, it's a stringed instrument like a guitar. And so, two notes are played that are very similar, but their frequencies are, are bit off, and therefore you hear a new frequency, which is called the beat frequency. For example, a pure frequency might, be, might sound like doom, and then the person plays another frequency just like that, but a little bit different. And then a new frequency comes in between them. So they play the first one, doom, the second one, doom, and then they hear a new frequency, doom. And it is that new frequency between the two frequencies which represents the beat frequency. And in order to calculate that frequency, that new one, which is oscillating, one just looks at the difference in frequencies. And sometimes on the MCAT exam, the question will be that simple. They'll give you two different frequencies and they'll ask you what the beat frequency is. You either understand it or you don't, but now you should. The next equation that must be memorized is the following. V equals lambda frequency. V is the velocity of a wave, is equal to lambda, the wavelength, times F, the frequency of the wave. Now, I must say that uh, there is a special case of this equation, and that's for light, because light has a constant velocity, and that velocity is C, and that's given by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. And that's the velocity of light. So that's a special case for this equation. But this equation, V equals lambda nu uh, frequency, uh, which is lambda, which is the wavelength, this equation can be used uh, in any uh, type of wave. So if you wanted to calculate the uh, wave that's uh, being propagated in the water, 
or a sound wave or if you go to the uh, stadium and you're watching an NFL game and you want to calculate the frequency of the wave that people are doing, you just measure the wavelength and then you can uh, measure the velocity of the wave and then you can calculate the frequency or uh, whatever variable happens to be missing. And then the final equation to do with waves, which must be memorized, very important equation is E is equal to H F where E is the energy of the wave, which is equal to H Planck's constant, obviously constant value, and you do not need to memorize the value of this constant, times F, which is the frequency of the wave. A classic question which they can ask you on the MCAT exam is, what would happen to the energy of the wave if the wavelength is doubled? So if the wavelength is doubled, if the, there's no other change in the medium, then the velocity would be constant. Because we mentioned that in solids, the velocity would be higher, or if there was more kinetic energy, or something of that nature. But if the medium is the same, then the velocity of the wave will be unchanged. So if the wavelength doubles, we expect the frequency of the wave will be halved. If the frequency of the wave is halved, and this is a constant, if we have half the frequency of the wave, then we would have half the energy of the wave. We've already discussed longitudinal waves with respect to sound. And we said that a longitudinal wave is where disturbed particles vibrate in the same direction of the advancing wavefront. Well, let's look at that a little closer. Those disturbed particles, for example, here in green, is a disturbed particle which is vibrating. And the wavefront is advancing. And the way it advances, just imagine a speaker again, and the speaker pushes particles. And the particles are disturbed as the wavefront is advancing. And the way that it is disturbed, it's disturbed in high pressure zones called condensation or compression waves. And then there are low pressure zones. And this is an area of rarefaction. And this is how the sound progresses. Now it requires a material medium. Because it requires a material medium, it is called a mechanical wave. And because it pushes particles, it prefers to have an elastic medium in order to propagate. Now when you see these high and low pressure zones, I can't help but to think of a concept called resonance. Now resonance in physics has a completely different meaning as it does in organic chemistry or general chemistry. In physics, uh, the idea of resonance is where there is a pitch, which is the same thing as frequency, where, is there, where there is a pitch that happens to be at the same level of the intrinsic frequency of another object. For example, you see a champagne glass and somebody hits it and it makes a sound. So you hit the champagne glass and it goes ding. Well, there are sopranos that are able to hit that sound precisely, that frequency in such a precise way and hold it there, that they would shatter the glass. Because if you hit the intrinsic frequency of something, then it vibrates at the same frequency and then the bonds can shatter. In fact, there's a famous bridge from Tacoma. And what happened to that particular bridge uh, back in the 1940s is a few months after it was built, there were some light winds in this huge bridge, suspension bridge, just some light winds, and suddenly the bridge started vibrating and shattered. And it's felt that either the winds or the sound coming from a smokestack just hit the correct pitch or frequency of the intrinsic frequency of the bridge, and it just shattered the entire bridge, which is quite incredible. 
So of course uh, now bridges go through wind tunnels and stuff like that before they're actually built. So don't worry about going home tonight or whatever else. So that's pitch and frequency. Now in terms of the frequencies that we can hear, uh, humans can hear frequencies between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Frequencies below 20 hertz are called infrasonic and above 20,000 hertz is ultrasonic. Now we've talked about intensity already. We talked about how intensity is related to amplitude. And we also said that intensity is loudness. Well, intensity is proportional more specifically to the square of the amplitude times the square of the frequency, which is in turn proportional to power per unit area. You don't have to really memorize these equations because you know this already. Because you know that when things are loud, you, you know, you put your speakers on and you, you turn up the volume on your stereo or whatever, and it's very loud. If it's very loud, that means that the amplitude is high, right? Because you have an amplifier to increase the amplitude. So, and you also know that the amplitude is related to the power more power, more amplitude, more loudness, more energy, because power is energy per unit time, so more energy. So all those things you knew already. And you also had the experience, I'm sure your neighbors have had the experience, that lower frequencies uh, transmit uh, more powerfully than high frequencies. <laughs> so uh, your neighbors know this because uh, they feel the vibrations um, through the walls and so on. And we already talked about the fact that solids are better transmitters than, for example, air or gas. Now, these are interesting equations, but you don't need to memorize these equations, as I, I just said. But regarding loudness, you do need to understand the equations for decibels. Now we've come to an equation which you definitely need to be comfortable using and that is the equation for sound level in decibels. And that is that the sound level in decibels is equal to 10 log i over i0. Now some uh, textbooks will actually put beta here, but the beta, it doesn't matter because it's in units of decibels. And then it's equal to 10 log i, which is the intensity in question, over i0, which is the threshold intensity. The threshold intensity is defined as 10 to the minus 12 watts per centimeter squared. And at that threshold intensity, uh, the number of decibels is zero. So zero decibels is the loudness, which is barely audible. Uh, decibels of about, say, 30 would be a whisper. Uh, 70 would be a vacuum cleaner, not a vacuum because there's no sound in a vacuum, but a vacuum cleaner, which makes sound. So, um, and uh, let's say 150 decibels would be a jet flying over your head. So uh, that gives you a general idea of how that works. Now it's a logarithmic scale. And, um, you know, judging from the types of questions they like to ask on the MCAT, this is a very useful equation and you can solve anything that they give you based on this equation, no problem. This equation over here makes things faster and easier. And this equation says that the change in volume is equal to 10 log I nu, the new intensity level, over the old intensity level. So if they say that the intensity level is say 10 times, 10 times higher, and they ask, what is the change in volume? So if you have 10 times higher, it means that you'll have 10 I old over I old. Because it's I old, it's 10 times higher. I new is now 10 I old. So you have 10 I old over I old. I old cancels. So you have 10 log 10. Log 10 is 1. So you have a change in volume of 10. So if you have 10 times the intensity, the change in volume is 10 decibels. If you had 100 times the intensity, 
a hundred iold over iold, iold cancel. You have log 100. Log 100 is log 10 squared. Log 10 squared, you've got log 10 base 10. So that's one. So the squared comes over. So you get 10 log 10 squared. The log 10 base 10 is simply 1. The squared comes over to the front. That's 20. So the change of volume is 20. So you have 20 decibels. So 100 times the intensity adds 20 decibels. 1,000 times the intensity would add 30 decibels. So, um, so you see each 10 times intensity adds 10 decibels to the loudness. So that's, this is the practical aspect of the equation, uh, which comes up rather often on the MCAT. And uh, this is the basic equation in its natural form. the Doppler effect. Now here is another equation that you do not need to memorize, fortunately. So what is the Doppler effect? The Doppler effect has to do with the following. The idea that when you have a source of a frequency and you have another location in which you're observing this frequency, what happens is that the observed frequency is different from the source frequency if the distance between them is increasing or decreasing. This equation permits us to calculate the observed frequency in comparison with the source frequency. Now let's get a more comfort with the idea that this observed frequency is changing. You actually have experienced this many, many times. For example, if you're standing on a street corner and a car goes by you at high speed. The car goes So as the car approaches you, the frequency of the car seems to go up. The frequency or the pitch actually goes up and then the frequency or pitch goes down to another level as it goes by you, as it's going away from you. That's your experience or feeling of the Doppler effect. Let's consider another example. Let's go back to the beach. So let's say you're at Cancun and you're thinking of physics because that's what you like to do on the beach. And so the waves are coming in at one per second. Let's say, so they're coming in at one per second and you're standing there. So you experience the frequency of the waves as one per second. But if you start running towards the source or running towards the waves, instead of experiencing them one per second, you're going to start experiencing them two per second or three per second, depending on how fast you're running towards the waves. So you experience waves just like you would experience sound waves more frequently, increased frequency if you're going towards the source. Likewise, if you're going away from the waves, you start walking away from the waves, for example, then suddenly instead of experiencing them one per second, as you did when you were just standing, you will experience them less than one per second because as you're going away from the waves, you're just going to experience them less uh, as a result of that, as a result of the fact that you are moving away. So likewise, this is, this is incorporated in this equation. And so we have the observed frequency and we have the source frequency. Then we have V which is the velocity of sound in that medium. So the velocity of sound, for example, in air is about 330 meters per second, but you do not need to memorize that either. So you have the velocity of sound in that medium, same thing, velocity of sound, the capital V. Then you have the velocity of the observer, and here is the velocity of the source. Now, there's a plus or minus in between because it depends on if you're moving towards or away uh, as to whether or not the observed frequency will be up or down. So for example, as mentioned, if the source and the observer are moving towards each other, then the observed frequency will increase. 
So if they're both moving towards, or even if one's moving towards and the other one's not moving, the observed frequency will increase. That's incorporated into the equation. So what you're expecting is that FO will go up, will be higher than FS, if they are approaching each other. So if they are both approaching each other, we would expect that the numerator would be higher than just the velocity of sound in air, for example. It would be higher than this value because if the numerator is greater than it makes, then the numerator is multiplied by fs, then it creates a greater fo, a greater observed frequency. So if the observer has a velocity and it, the velocity is towards the source, then the VO is going to be positive. If the observer is going away from the source, then the VO will be negative. Likewise, down here, in the, numer in the denominator, if the denominator is high, well, that will decrease FS and therefore decrease FO. So if the numerator is low, then we end up with a higher FO. So if we have the observer and the source going towards each other, we end up with a positive VO and we end up with negative VS. By having negative VS, it reduces the denominator, which makes this whole part or factor higher, which increases the observed frequency. And the opposite would be true if they are moving away from each other. If they are moving away from each other, then we're going to get negative VO, which reduces this factor, and we get positive VS, which again reduces this whole factor. Because they're moving away from each other, then the observed frequency will be reduced. So, what are they going to give you in the MCAT? Are they going to give you a bunch of numbers? You got to calculate a bunch of stuff concerning this? Well, normally if they're going to give you something, they'll give you the equation and they'll let you calculate things. But even that is unusual for the MCAT because they want to just really test if you understand the concept. So a typical question on the MCAT would be, there is a sound wave being emitted uh, from a source and describe the relationship with the following variables uh, that might be um, noticed by a particular individual, of course, the observer. And so what they'll have for your ABCD is that the frequency, given that the distance is decreasing, what they will have for ABCD is that the frequency increases, frequency decreases, or frequency remains the same. But wait, they'll also have and the velocity increases, decreases, or stays the same. And so they'll have this combination of answers for A, B, C, D. That's a classic MCAT question. So the issue they're really asking is that when there is a decrease in distance, do you know what happens to the frequency and do you know what happens to the velocity of the wave? So for frequency, you would have no problem. Based on the analogy that we just talked about, about the waves and so on, um, you will be able to notice immediately that if the distance is decreasing, then the frequency of the waves will be increased. No problem there. And then for velocity, from what we've talked about waves, you should also recognize the velocity is not going to change. The velocity of the observer and the source is not changing. That's not what's changing. In fact, we know already, we've discussed that the velocity is constant in a constant medium. The temperature is not changing. We're not talking about going from, from air to solid, you know, so that medium is remaining the same. So the velocity will be constant. It's the frequency which is being altered. Now we move on to optics. First, a couple of definitions. A real image. In a real image, light 
actually passes through the image point. In a virtual image, light behaves as though it diverges from the image point even though it does not pass through the image point. We will look at clear examples of both real images and virtual images. But first, a couple of equations which certainly must be memorized. The first, which is a derivation of the lens maker equation, is 1 over O plus 1 over I is equal to 1 over F, which in turn is equal to 2 over R. O is the object distance, I the image distance, F the focal length, and R the radius of curvature. So you can see that there's the, this equation. There's also the equation which relates the focal length to the radius of curvature. The next equation you must memorize deals with magnification, where m is equal to negative i over o. m is the magnification, i the image distance, o the object distance. It's very important to recall the negative symbol before i over o. When the magnification is negative, then the object is inverted. When the magnification is positive, then the object is erect. Now that we have some of the basics done, we're going to go on and look at reflection. Now we will begin looking at reflection. The most simple mirror to examine is a plane mirror. A plane mirror is a flat mirror. We say it's plane, P-L-A-N-E, meaning it's flat, not plane as in P-L-A-I-N, which is a regular mirror. It so happens that a plane mirror is a regular mirror. Anyway, so let's imagine that there is an object in front of the mirror. So here's an object in front of the mirror. In optics, whenever we use a capital letter, it refers to the position of something. Small case letters refer to the distance. For example, here is the position of the object, large O, and the distance of the object to the mirror would be small o, which would be the object distance, which is the figure or the number or the variable which we can use in the equation that we saw before. So now, if we were to put an object in front of a mirror, the object would be sending out light rays in an infinite number of directions. Some of these light rays uh, would be coming in the following direction. So in other words, we're going to just look at a subset, a small number of light rays in order to solve problems. So there would be a light ray coming from the object going directly to the mirror. When this light ray hits the mirror, it will be reflected back towards the object. There will also be light rays that would be going off at various angles when a light ray comes to the mirror, this light ray which arrives at the mirror would be called the incident ray. Then there will be a light ray that once it hits the mirror would be reflected away. So this light ray would be called the reflected ray. Now, if we were to draw a normal line to the mirror, and a normal line is defined as a perpendicular line. So I will draw here this dotted line, which is a perpendicular line to the mirror. It is such that the incident ray and the reflected ray are related. 
if we were to draw an angle in here, theta, the angle in here, theta, this angle between the incident ray and the normal line would be called the angle of incidence. This angle between the reflected ray and the normal line would be called the angle of reflection. It is such that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection always. Now, if you look at the geometry, we have parallel lines here and here, and we have a line coming across in this manner. So, in high school, we used to say this is called the Z rule, where the inner angles are equivalent. So this would also be equal to theta. Okay, so in summary, we have an object that is sitting in front of a flat or plane mirror. Light rays can hit the mirror and then reflected back towards the object. Other light rays going off at various angles such that the angle of incidence is always equal to the angle of reflection. Well, let us start to examine these lines and we'll look at the ge geometry of what has happened. We're going to extrapolate backwards in this manner following the direction of this line and we get to a point over here and this point is called the image point. So a capital I is used because it represents the position of the image. Small i is used here representing the distance from the image to the mirror. All this within the limits of my ability to draw of course which is severely limited. Nonetheless, this gives you the general idea. A couple of points. The first thing they're going to want to know is, is this image virtual or real? I will show you why this is a virtual image and there are three important reasons. The first reason is our definition. We said that in a real image, light actually passes through the image point. Clearly, if this is a mirror and the object is in front of the mirror, well then light is not passing behind the mirror. So this image point must be virtual. And in fact, our definition of a virtual image is that light behaves as though it diverges from the image point even though it does not pass through the image point. So it fits within our definition. The other point is that when we have a positive value, the image is real, and we have a negative value, the image is virtual. So here, clearly, the object being in front of the mirror has a positive value, which is the distance to the mirror, but the image is in the opposite direction. It's in the other direction and therefore it will have a negative value. So here, I don't know what the value of uh, the O is, the object distance. I don't know what the value of I is, the image distance. But I know that I is going to equal negative O. In other words, I is going to have a negative value because it's in the opposite direction of the object distance. So here is the second reason why I would be virtual. And then the third reason is your intuition. Consider this. If this was indeed a mirror and I was standing in front of the mirror, then I would be seeing my image reflected off the mirror coming back towards me. And when I look at the mirror, it would appear as though the image of myself in the mirror is behind the mirror. So I'm the object in front of the mirror and I see my image 
behind the mirror. And it appears as though the image of myself is as far behind the mirror as I am in front of the mirror. The translation of that in mathematics is I is equal to negative O. However, if I'm standing in front of the mirror and let's say that behind the, this mirror is a hallway, well then clearly my image is not in the hallway behind the mirror. It's a virtual image. It is not actually there. There is not light rays that are actually passing through that point in the hallway. And if you were to go around this mirror and look in the hallway looking for the image, well then I guess that would be a bit silly or counterintuitive at least. So here are three reasons why in front of the plane mirror the image is virtual. Now let us look at a spherical mirror. This is a plane mirror. We will look at a spherical mirror and in a spherical mirror it is curved. So we're looking at a spherical mirror. Now we have an object here, that's the object point, in front of the spherical mirror and let's draw an axis to the mirror. When we draw an axis from our object to a spherical mirror, the intersection with the mirror is called the vertex V. So this is the vertex V, which is just the intersection of the axis which we draw from the object to the mirror. Well, this kind of mirror is concave. And uh, you may remember from high school hearing that if it goes in like a cave, it's concave. And then, of course, convex would be the opposite. So emanating from this object is an infinite number of light rays. It so happens that concave mirrors are converging mirrors. So they converge light. So some light rays coming from this object would be going straight here and hitting the mirror and then going back to the object. The distance between the object and the vertex V would be our object distance small o. Light rays emanating from the object in various directions may hit the mirror like, like thus and converge to a point. This point is called the image point. The distance between the image point and the vertex would be small i. Now, a curved mirror must curve around some point. So, in other words, it's just like a circle. A circle has a center and it has a radius and then the circle curves around the center. Well, in the same sense, there is a center about which a curved mirror curves. So this point here is the center of curvature. The distance between the center of curvature and the vertex V is the radius of curvature. So now we start to develop many of the terms that we saw in our equation from before. 1 over O plus 1 over I is equal to 1 over F which is equal to 2 over R. Where here's the radius of curvature. Indeed we can calculate the focal length from the radius of curvature because 1 over F is equal to 2 over R. And we also have our object distance and our image distance. So first simple question. Is this image virtual or real? We start with our definition. Our definition of a real image is light actually passes through the image point. Clearly light reflected from the mirror actually passes through this point. So this is the image point. And 
you might wonder, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and there is an experiment in which <clears throat> a stick is placed here, an object is placed here, a curved mirror is placed here, then you take a screen, just a white screen, and the screen is moved along the stick. And once the screen gets to this point, voila, you have the object in clear focus at this point, the image point, because light actually passes through that point, so you can get the consequences of that light passing through the point right here by placing, for example, a screen. And there you can calculate the image distance, you know where you put the object, so that's the object distance, therefore you can calculate either the radius of curvature or the focal length of the lens. So here we have a real image and uh, obviously a real object placed before the mirror. So the next question that they can ask, besides the issue of real or virtual, they can ask you whether or not the image is erect or inverted. In other words, if the object was an arrow pointing up, over here, would the arrow be pointing up or pointing down once you place the screen there? And for that, we use our magnification equation, where m is equal to negative i over o. Now recall, here we have an object distance before the mirror. Clearly, that's a positive distance. Here we have the image distance in front of the mirror, as opposed to what we saw with the plane mirror. This image is in front of the mirror, so clearly this is a positive image distance. That's another reason why this must be a real image. So we have a positive I and a positive O. Even though we don't know what the values of I and O are, we know that they mo both must be positive. And if they're both positive, both I and O is positive, that means the magnification would be negative. If the magnification is negative, by our definition, it must be inverted because we said a positive magnification meant that the image would be erect and a negative magnification meant that the image would be inverted. The next question that they could ask is, is the image diminished or enlarged? Meaning, whatever size you started with as an object, when you examined the image, would the image be smaller or would it be bigger? Well, consider this. If I were to tell you that something had the magnification of 50, that would mean that the image that you're looking at is 50 times larger than the object. So if the magnification was 10 times, then you knew that the image is 10 times larger than the object. And finally, if the magnification was 1 half, well, that would mean that the image is smaller than the object. In other words, if you have a magnification less than one, it would mean that the image is smaller than the object. And if the magnification is greater than one, it would mean that the image is larger than the object. So I don't know what the value of the image distance is, and I don't know what the value of the object distance is but I do know that the image distance is clearly less than the object distance. So in the magnification equation, if the image distance is less than the object distance, clearly we'll end up with a fraction. And a fraction being less than one means that we'll end up having a diminished image. Now that we've examined reflection, we're going to go on to refraction. Now we're going to look at refraction. Now just to compare, in reflection we saw that when the incident ray hit the mirror, it was reflected in such a way that the angle of incidence always equals the angle of reflection. In refraction, we have something different. We have that a light ray that hits a medium which is more dense, for example, a light ray which is traveling in the air hits glass 
which is a medium which is more dense, what will happen is that the light ray will bend and refraction is discussing and looking at what happens when that light ray bends while it's going into this other medium. So to discuss refraction we're going to look at thin lenses. So these are thin lenses of glass. So here is a thin lens. This lens is a convex lens, also called a biconvex lens because it's convex on both surfaces. We put in front of the lens our object. Once again, the distance between our object and the lens would be our object distance small o. Coming from this object would be light rays emanating at an infinite number of different directions. Some of the light rays may come in directions such as this one. So the light ray hits the lens like so. Well, the lens, being a convex lens, converges light. Convex lenses converge light and concave lenses diverge light. And you can see already there's going to be a difference between reflection and refraction. So the light converges to a point, that point being the image point. So the first question, is this image real or virtual? Well, our definition of a real image is that light actually passes through the image point. So clearly the light ray passes through this point. So this indeed is a real image. The distance between the image point and the lens would be our image distance small i. What is interesting is that this is a positive distance the distance between the object and the lens. That's a positive distance O. This distance here is also a positive distance. This is another difference between reflection and refraction. After all, in reflection, because it's a mirror, the only way that the object and the image can both be real is if they're on the same side of the mirror, because the mirror reflects and there is no light passing onto the other side. However, for a lens, light from the object passes through the lens. So to have a real image, it has to be on the other side. And therefore, the distance between the image and the lens has to be positive. So here we have a real object and a real image. And therefore, once again, a simple experiment is by putting an object in front of a thin lens and taking a screen and moving the screen until the object is completely in focus. We would know our image distance. We would have known where we placed the object. And therefore, we can calculate the focal length or the radius of curvature of the lens according to the equation we saw 1 over O plus 1 over I is equal to 2 over R or equal to 1 over F. Let's look at another scenario. Now we will look at a concave thin lens or a biconcave thin lens. We place our object here and coming from the object are our light rays going in innumerable different directions. Some of the light rays will hit the lens like so. Now, when the light ray hits the lens, because this is a concave lens, the light will diverge. Because a concave lens diverges light. So the light diverges. But we can extrapolate backwards to a point here. And that will be our image point. Once again, the distance between I and the lens would be our image distance. The distance between O and the lens is our object distance. Now, 
If we were to look at our definitions, is this a real or virtual image? Clearly, light does not pass through this point. Light behaves as though it diverges from this point, even though it does not pass through this point. That is our definition of a virtual image. So we've seen a real image and a virtual image with uh, lenses or in the context of refraction, and we've also seen it in the context of reflection. Now there's just a couple of things to uh, memorize in terms of equations. First, we'll look at the power of a lens. There are a couple of equations that you must memorize. <clears throat> the first one has to do with the power of the lens. If you wear glasses or if you have contact lenses, you may have heard your optician refer to the power of your lenses. So first of all, the power of a lens is given in units of diopters. The equation is simply the power of the lens is equal to 1 over f where f is the focal length of the lens. What is important to remember is that the f is given in units of meters. So when you have to calculate the power of the lens, it is important to convert the focal length to meters, and then you just take the inverse. So the question could be that simple on the MCAT exam. They can give you the focal length in centimeters, for example, and then just ask for the power of the lens. Then you convert to meters, and then you just take the inverse to get the power of the lens. The value may be positive if it is a converging lens, and negative if it's a diverging lens. Next, we're going to look at Snell's Law. Snell's Law describes mathematically in what way does light bend as it passes from one medium to another. For example, let's imagine there's a surface here and there's a light ray that's coming and hits the surface. So here is a light ray coming down and hits this surface. Well, different surfaces, different media, have a different ability to bend light. And so when the light ray hits this medium, we can draw a normal line. And a normal line, as I mentioned earlier, is just a perpendicular line to the surface. So let's draw a perpendicular line to this surface. So we have an incident ray arriving at the surface then you can imagine this surface being something like the surface of water where the incident ray is in the air and then it comes down, it hits the surface of the water and then it's going to be bent by the water. So as it comes, it hit this angle here would be of course the angle of incidence which is the angle between the incident ray and the normal line. Once it hits the surface, it will bend. Now, depending on the medium, it may bend towards the normal line as if it was going into a heavier medium, or it may bend away from the normal line if it were going into a lighter medium. Now, let's look at a, an, an example where the, it's coming from water, for example, and is going into a lighter medium like air. Then it would bend away from the medium and then this would be the refracted ray. And then we would have another angle here, which would be the angle of refraction. So if we had two different uh, media, one up here and one down here, each medium, as I meant, said before, has a different ability to bend light. Let's say that we call this N1 up here. N1 would represent the index of refraction or the ability of this substance to bend light. N2 down here for this medium down here would be the ability of this medium to be able to bend light. It is such that the higher the index of refraction, 
is the greater the ability of that substance to bend light. <clears throat> so let's call this angle theta 1 and we'll call this angle theta 2. Well, Snell's law gives us the relationship between these variables such that n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. And this would certainly be one of the equations to memorize. Now we're going to look at a very important consequence of this relationship and a special case to develop the idea of the critical angle. <clears throat>